Okay, thank you, Christoph. So, as you said, my name is Richard Barton. I'm an engineer at ARM working on LLVM. And we're going to talk to you today about some work we've been doing in the last few months about guaranteeing the correctness of MC for ARM. So, just a quick um, overview of what MC is. I know we've just had a talk about it, but uh, to start from a common base. Uh, so, MC stands for machine code. Uh, it's a single target um, specific, a single location for target specific information for representing your machine instructions. So the diagram shows a sort of typical compiler flow. Start with your uh, source code and put it through all of the normal compiler phases, front, mid end, and then right at the very end you get the MC layer, which uh, will convert it into assembly code or object code if you've got an integrated assembler or code to be jitted. Uh, so this is uh, multi-platform, obviously it has all of the uh, has a MC version for each platform you're targeting. Um, and it's multi-directional as well, so it can go from assembly to object file, object uh, code for an assembler and the reverse for a disassembler. And it's all generated from tables, which uh, you might see some, well, you will see some of later, and they're particularly unpleasant. Um, so I think it's fair to say the MC is pretty much a cornerstone of all LLVM code generation tools, so your compilers, your assemblers, uh, debuggers, your JIT tools, which we talked about, which Eli talked about uh, in the last presentation. Uh, so we need this component to be trustworthy in order to be able to build great tools with it. So we need to find out, we at ARM are interested in guaranteeing that correctness. How can we guarantee it? Um, another question would be how trustworthy is, sorry, I thought I had an animation there. How trustworthy is uh, the MC layer right now for ARM, which we'll answer later. So just to scope the problem a little bit uh, tighter, because MC does handle quite a lot of things, uh, we're going to be testing four sort of transformations um, in MC. So the diagram shows three sort of states. You can think of these as a kind of uh, a representation, an abstraction of a, an instruction that maybe get executed on a platform. So one, is, one abstraction is the bit pattern, the encoded bit pattern that you'll execute. One would be a line of assembly, an assembly instruction, and the MC inst is the kind of internal LLVM abstraction. So we're going to be testing and trying to prove the correctness of four transformations. So the one which will go from a bit pattern to the internal representation, which we're going to call decode, and the reverse of that, which is an encode, and similarly, the transformation which takes uh, an assembly instruction and turns it to the internal representation, which is an assemble, and the inverse of that is a disassemble. So, as I said, MC contains a lot of target-specific information. Chiefly, the piece that's missing from this, which we won't be testing, is the big arrow coming in from the from the left, which is the rest of the compiler generating these MC ints before they get transformed into or output into bit patterns or assembly. So instruction selection. But we won't be testing that. We're just testing these four um, functions. So we're testing MC very much in isolation. So the strategy, let's take a sip of water. So the strategy uh, for this uh, we feel the only way to guarantee this is exhaustively checking the whole problem space against a known correct implementation with the same functionality. So it kind of sounds fairly obvious, um, but we think this is a, which is a target, an architecture agnostic uh, approach. So this is not just specific to ARM if you were trying to bring up another architecture or prove the correctness of another architecture in MC. Uh, it could equally be applied if you were building a new architecture into MC, support for a new architecture. It could be applied as well. So we should say, what do we mean by exhaustive uh, checking? So obviously checking the whole space. So what is this space? So we've, we've defined the problem space as having four dimensions. So the first dimension is your instruction encoding. So this is a 32-bit number for ARM. I know Intel have variable length instruction encoding, so their space is larger. We have the instruction set. So many architectures have multiple instruction sets. 
ARM has ARM and a thumb instruction set, which is a 16-bit instruction set rather than 32. Um, Intel has 32-bit and 64-bit instruction sets. The architecture variant. So most, uh, most architectures are built in sort of generations, and you would add new uh, features in each generation, and the whole genera most generations are backward compatible. So, for example, um, the current generation is V7, uh, and MIPS has these two, but I don't know much about them. And the four functionalities that we talked about earlier. So this is quite a large space, generally. Uh, so the problem space for ARM, if we were to just check that, uh, the instruction encoding, as we said, 32, 2 to 32 possible values. The instruction set has two. The architecture variant is a little more complicated. Um, there are uh, a lot of uh, optional architecture extensions for ARM, which add extra instructions. Um, so V7 has a lot of these. There are 176 combinations of those, plus the, plus the pre V7 architectures and combinations. There are 204 possible values, and we have four values for the MC functionality. So that is a sort of order of seven trillion point test space. So if we want to check them all, it's going to take quite a long time. Uh, so let's take a look at the theory behind how we might go about testing these MC uh, transformations. So this diagram is a kind of theoretical approach. There's a couple of exceptions to this, which I will talk about later. So start with bit pattern one in the bottom left and go clockwise. So you would take a bit pattern, you would decode it into the internal representation and disassemble it into an assembly string. Um, UAL stands for Unified Assembler Language, which is an ARM thing. It's basically a common assembly syntax between the two instruction sets. Um, so once you have a uh, assembly string, you can use your golden reference implementation, which uh, will have a compatible assembly format and assemble and encode it back into another bit pattern, which you can test. And the two bit patterns should be identical. And if they aren't, there's a bug somewhere. And obviously, your reference implementation is perfect. So there must be a bug in MC, which you can find and fix. So you'll notice that this golden reference implementation is an assembler, something which takes an assembly, a line of assembly, and turns it into an instruction encoding. That's an assembler. So once you have a perfect uh, decoder, you can then, it then becomes bug free, and you can use it to test the encoder and make sure the encoder is perfect. So again, start on bit pattern one, clockwise round, you decode it into the internal representation, re encode it, and the two bit patterns should be the same. So uh, there's nothing to stop you here from using the reference implementation's perfect decoder if you want, but obviously, uh, just to show that you only really need an assembler to start this process off. And then there's one transformation left, which is the assemble step. So this is very similar to the first diagram. You take a bit pattern one, and you decode and disassemble it into a string, uh, assembly string, and then you can test the assembler by assembling that string and using your perfect encoder to turn it back into a bit pattern that you compare with the first one, and they should be the same. So the middle diagram much simpler. Uh, in all these cases, we're going to iterate over the bit patterns because they're much easier to enumerate because they are numbers, uh, rather than iterating over all possible assembly strings, which is a much larger uh, set of values. Um, so at this point, we should say that this is all, we think this is all target in specific. This is all architecture agnostic. Uh, you can start this process off with an assembler which you consider to be good enough or trustworthy enough and you can use it to make sure MC is as trustworthy as that reference implementation. So to move on from the theory, we can talk about the uh, implementation. So this does become a bit ARM specific now. Uh, so the first thing, you're building a, a test suite, you need to name your test suite. So we feel that this test suite was a kind of stress test, a kind of a test that keeps relentlessly beating on the MC and, and, until, until it breaks. And we figured that we should probably say it was hammering on the MC. So we decided to call this the MC Hammer Test. Thank you. This is, this is MC Hammer, by the way. I, for legal reasons, uh, I was not able to use a MC Hammer gif of him doing his dance, which I pulled off of Google Images. So this is a Wikimedia Commons image from Wikipedia. It also meant that I could read his Wikipedia page, which was very interesting. Apparently, the MC in his name stands for Man of Christ because he's an ordained minister. 
So there you go. And he's been releasing records all this time. He released a record last year. And apparently now he's involved in a search engine project called Wiredo. So he's a bit of a hero. Uh, that's all Wikipedia knowledge as well, so it might not be true. Anyway, to move on from MC Hammer, uh, we should introduce iCodec. So iCodec is our golden reference implementation. Uh, you can think of it as a unified assembler language implementation. It, it, effectively, it does. It handles the same four interesting uh, transformations as MC does, luckily. Uh, it's the MC equivalent that's used in the ARM compiler toolchain, which is the proprietary ARM compiler of 20, 25 years. Um, it's been used in that for around five. There are no known bugs, so it's perfect, right? Yeah. Uh, and it's, and it's brilliant, but this is ARM proprietary IP, so you guys can't touch this. So let's talk about the ARM test space again. We said that that was a seven trillion point test space. So this is, this is quite big. We want to try and make it smaller. So can we cut this test space down? So the answer is yes, we can. We have, we talked about all the combinations of architecture uh, extensions. Some of these don't add instructions, so they aren't interesting from this point of view. Some of them are incompatible. Uh, some architectures only support certain instruction sets. So, for example, the V6M is a thumb-only instruction set, so that's a Cortex-M0 for any ARM-savvy uh, hackers. So, uh, as I said, some of the instruction set combinations aren't compatible. So the V7 instruction set is not compatible with the older VFP architectures. So VFP V2, VFP V3, and 4 are the modern ones. Uh, and often, the extensions are fairly orthogonal. So if you were testing the VFP instructions and if you've got a security extension, that probably wouldn't interact in any sort of way. So you maybe don't need to test all the different combinations. So just, just these, there's still quite a lot of points. A Cortex-A8 core, there are 34 billion points in the test space. So we need to try and figure out a way of tackling it in slightly smaller portions. So we're going to be slicing through the test space. Uh, so we define a slice as a four-tuple uh, with values for each of the four dimensions that we spoke about. So just a few examples of these. Sorry, this is all text. Um, but this, so this is a, uh, so this slice is all of the 16-bit numbers, so all the 16-bit instruction encodings running on a V5TE architecture, which is an ARM 10, I think, or no, an ARM 9E, uh, according to my notes. And that's for the thumb instruction set, and we're testing the assemble stage of MC, so the third diagram from from earlier. Uh, another slice may be the 32-bit instruction space for a, an ARM v7 with VFPv3, a neon unit, half-precision extension, and security extensions, which is a Qualcomm Scorpion. And that's for ARM and testing the encode decode uh, diagram that we showed earlier. That's the second one, the very simple one. And finally, when we implemented this, we also implemented a kind of bitwise uh, uh, format for these slices. So you can actually specify it individual bits with X's for don't cares, not so ones for not so ones. And um, so this kind of rather cryptic is a flag setting multiply, but of course all of you on guys knew that. Uh, and then we're testing that for V7A, so Cortex-A8 on ARM, and we're testing the disassemble, so the other diagrams. So look, I've covered all three diagrams. Okay, so I said earlier that there was a, a few exceptions. So this is the nice theory uh, you can take a bit pattern, pipe it through a number of transformations, and it should spit out another bit pattern. And if they're the same, there are no bugs. Well, unfortunately, that's not quite the case, because what happens if ah, there's an undefined instruction? So your bit pattern does not correspond to an instruction. So normally, uh, an assembler would, or sorry, a disassembler would emit a, a DCI, which is a DCI assembly directive, which is just allocating a couple of words of memory with the value in it uh, that your bit pattern one was. And then your reference implementation would just say, oh, yes, it's one of those, and just gleefully turn it back into the same number. And you wouldn't notice if, for example, MC was saying this was undefined, when actually it was a real instruction, which should have turned it into a, a proper instruction. So at this stage, if MC tells you it's undefined, you need to take your bit pattern and put it through a reference implementations, perfects, decode, and disassembler, just to check if it really is undefined. So as well as your perfect assembler, you, can't, you also need some sort of disassembler, some like obj dump or something like that, just to check these corner cases. 
Uh, and so we take advantage of this. We actually, when we implemented this, we actually, rather than comparing numbers, we actually compared the internal representation of iCodex. So it's uh, analog to MCINTS, and that gave us better diagnostics as well, because you can uh, compare them slightly more intelligently than just bit by bit. Okay, so, so this is the theory. Let's talk about one bug that I found. So this was the first bug that I found using this approach. Um, so the little box shows what MC Hammer tells me. MC Hammer tells me that running on a Cortex A8 with VFP and Neon for ARM, I'm running over the bottom quarter of the instruction uh, uh, encoding space. And I'm testing that encode decode loop, just the diagrams down the bottom for you. And this, the, the symptom is that the test suite sigaborts and tells me which bit pattern it sigaborts on. So that bit pattern uh, is a VCVT uh, vector floating point instruction, which converts to a number from floating point to fixed point. Um, that's the instruction there. So, and this. This was causing a sigaboard. So most of the sigaboards, obviously, because the reference implementation is perfect, must be coming from MC. So we track it down, and we find that the the register operand was not being uh, accounted for in the table gen. So in MC's tables, where it has all of its details about how its instructions are encoded, the register operand was missing completely. So that was causing the internal representation to have a couple of missing operands because it wasn't expecting to read one. And then when the encoder tried to turn this back into an instruction, it would look for this operand, find that it didn't exist, and there would be an assertion failure. So that's the reason for the sigaboard. Now, the uh, bottom of the slide shows that, uh, so this is from the ARM architecture reference manual. So this is the VCVT instruction. Um, apologies if it looks very horrible, you don't have to read it. Um, and you can see the highlighted bit is that uh, the register value is encoded in bits 15 to 12 and with one bit in 22. And the bit is either the least significant or most significant bit, depending on whether it's a single precision or a double precision instruction. So all very interesting. Um, the fix was to go, so this is table gen. The fix was to go into the table gen and put in an account for these uh, these missing operands. So the bits in red are the kind of the bits that were added. Um, you can see there's a class there. So the, the advantage of table gen is it's all kind of, there's a class hierarchy, so you can um, push common encoding tricks up in the class hierarchy so you don't have to replicate them. So we have a class which uh, takes bit 22 and bits 15 to 12 turn, and maps them onto an operand which comes from up here somewhere. And then the uh, VTOSHS is the cryptic name for uh, this type of instruction. Make that a, a, an instance of the, of the class, and it all should work. And you can see that there's a single precision version of this, and there is also a double precision version of this, which is, has a D in the name. So all the names of these classes are kind of grim. Uh, I don't know who made them up, but or maybe they kind of just grew. But uh, yeah, they're not very nice. Uh, so anyway, there's the fix. Uh, so you can rebuild MC and check that it works by rerunning MC Hammer over the whole space with a bit mask, which is all the possible encodings of uh, VCVT instruction, and check that it works, and it does. Brilliant. So how, was, how had this bug kind of slipped through up until now? Well, looking at the regression tests, uh, they'd all been written with uh, the zero register. So by fluke, uh, this was being encoded correctly for the zero register and passing the test, but any other register you wanted to use, um, it was using uh, uh, register zero rather than register whatever. So one lesson is if you're writing a regression test for a function you've implemented, please use non-zero registers. Or don't always use zero registers. Maybe you can use them once, but not always. So we've been doing this for a few months now, and we've seen some common errors. So don't write regression tests with zero registers. Uh, so most, the most common error is that a lack of internal consistency within MC. So the MC ints are very kind of, they're kind of loose. I would say they're kind of like a struct of void pointers, really. Uh, so 
the way that these the way that the phases treat them are kind of very specific and they, they, they tend to the commonly used pass through MC, so assembling and encoding an instruction for an assembler by for example, normally they correspond correctly and same with the decode and the disassemble for a disassembler. But if you try to do something not on that path, they both do different things, both expect different things, and there are problems. So most of the bugs that we're seeing so far are because of that. Uh, we think probably the main reason for this is that the LLVMMC tool, which is the little sort of sandbox tool that you can use for testing MC in isolation, uh, doesn't have uh, options to give you all four of these combinations of transformations. So uh, you can disassemble, but you can't see, you can't then see what the encoding is. So you can't do the, uh, the encode decode loop. Um, so there's a patch for that, which is imminent, which has been waiting code review for some time. So if anyone wants to code review that um, while you're pretending to listen, um, that'd be great. Uh, the other main problem is uh, that ARM has this notion of an unpredictable instruction. So you can think of an unpredictable instruction as kind of like an undefined instruction. Um, I've had this explained to me, which I understand is to simplify the hardware implementation, they don't account for any corner cases. So an example of a corner case would be most, a lot of instructions, if you use the PC, the program counter register, as a, one of the register operands, it's unpredictable. It will do something weird. And ARM gives you no guarantee about what it does. So you can kind of think of these unpredictables as a kind of a software failure. So rather than accounting for these corner cases in the hardware and actually making a mole with a PC, for example, an undefined instruction, they rely on your software to tell you that this is not okay, so unpredictable. So currently MC, well, when we started this work, MC didn't really have any uh, model for this, no uh, support for unpredictability. So we've had to add that in. Um, we're kind of finding as we go along how unsupported it is uh, and, and trying to fix it. So I asked a question earlier about how untrust or how trustworthy, sorry, I said untrustworthy, that's very bad, how trustworthy the MC layer is now for ARM. So our initial uh, figure for that is we think roughly 10% of all instruction encodings are incorrectly encoded by MC at the moment. Um, we think it's roughly 18% for the assembly step, so 18% of uh, correct MC inst are incorrectly assembled. Uh, and we're kind of finding, we're kind of firming these numbers up as we go along. As we're ironing out corner cases in our test suite and making it better, we're kind of getting more accurate readings on these numbers. Um, so we're, we found that MC Hammer at the moment, just running with one thread, this is quite a parallelizable problem, but we've kind of implemented it in a very dumb way at the moment, um, can run 7 million tests a second in one thread. So Cortex-A8 takes about an hour just to run through all the instruction encodings to see if they're right. Um, the ones with string manipulation take quite a lot longer, um, obviously. Uh, so you couldn't put this into, say, an MC uh, regression test. It's too big. Um, so... Have we made any progress? What progress have we made? We've been probably given two man months of effort so far on fixing bugs that this has turned up. Um, we've submitted, well, this, these numbers are now completely wrong because I probably wrote them about a week ago. So we've got a number of patches, more than 14, uh, or 14 or more patches upstream, some more in code review. And we've seen the uh, encode and decode, or the encode decode failures go down by half a percent in uh, two man months. So, slow progress. Hopefully, this will be getting better because we're kind of creating some, some MC arm domain experts as we go along. That's me, apparently. Uh, so, hopefully, this might accelerate, but this is what we're currently working on at the moment. If we're going to be completely honest, uh, this talk came around a few months too early to give you some really interesting results so far, but we can explain the, uh, the method. So, in conclusion, how does this help the community? So... We're fixing bugs, that's great, but in a more profound way, I think, we think this is the, probably the first structured approach to really testing MC correctness in this way. Um, we're continuing to spend effort into this, and I hope by sharing it with you today, you can see that this is a architecture agnostic approach to checking correctness. This could be used on any 
uh, architecture that MT supports or if you're adding a new one. All that you're required to do or you're required to have is a reference implementation that you trust, that you want MC to be as good as. Um, you can normally start this process off with just an assembler and uh, some form of disassembler as well. And all that's required is an assembly syntax that that assembler can understand, which MC can also understand, and you can start this process yourself. And that's all I have to say. So any questions?